my name is um, Andre Davis. I'm at University of Portland, and I'm here with my co-investigator and research colleague and buddy, Dr. Lippi. You want to say hello? Sure. Hi, everyone. I'm Megan Lippi. I'm at the University of Texas Health Science Center, San Antonio, if you can't tell from my background. Um, and <laughs> Dr. Davis and I have worked together with uh, palliative care support for schools of nursing for many years, but more formally with LNEC for the last two years or so. So it's lovely to have y'all join us today as we talk about another LNEC module. Yes, I am going to share the screen really quick while we get rolling. And also introduce our lovely guest today, Dr. Pace, Judith Pace. A uh, quick introduction for those of you that um, are not familiar with her um, amazing work. Um, Dr. Pace is the director of the Cancer Pain Program um, in the Division of Hematology Oncology and a research professor in medicine at Northwestern University, Feinberg School of Medicine. And she's a member of the Robert Lurie Comprehensive Cancer Center as well. Um, she's with us today between patients, I think. She's actually in the clinic today. Uh, among her many accomplishments, Dr. Pace has impacted nursing and the direction of pain care, serving in many leadership roles, including the president of the past president of the American Pain Society. I'm not sure how past that was, um, but a, a hugely impactful role, as well as um, the secretary of the International Association for the Study of Pain and many, many things in um, nursing leadership and pain management um, and oncology care. So thank you so much for being here today. Uh, we are, we would love to hear from those of you in the chat where you're coming from. It's always really wonderful to see uh, returning folks. I'm trying to, um, Someone else might be able to see the chat better than I'm able to right now. I'll monitor it. Okay. Um, so if you could tell us where you're here from, um, we are going to be together until 10 o'clock Pacific time, one hour. And um, as those of you that have been here before, um, what one thing that may be familiar is, oh, here comes the information. Michigan, Brazil, seriously? Hello. Can uh, can we get a a wave from our Brazil colleague? Y'all matter, but that's pretty far. <laughs> and Armenia. Really, Nareen? Let's see. Yes, it is me. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. Hello, it's so wonderful. Um, Victoria. And then we have some uh, usual suspects that have been here before and some new folks. So um, as Dr. Leapy mentioned, we have been um, running this series, uh, Advancing Palliative Care Education in Schools of Nursing. Oh, my picture is displaced over some of the title. So sorry about that. Can you see the screen, everyone? Um, we are alternating uh, in this series between the undergraduate online modules and the graduate modules. And so it would be um, nice to know also those of you that are familiar with LNEC modules. Um, these first few slides will be sort of grounding in terms of why this is important to educators in, in nursing education. And then we're going to dive into exploring a little bit, looking at uh, the actual online module, and then spend some time in groups. It feels like we have kind of how many people do we have here today? It might be nice for us to get in some breakout rooms and have smaller conversation about how you are incorporating um, pain management and palliative care in your nursing program and share ideas because people are doing amazing things. Uh, so with that, let us uh, let me get started on the, the slides here just to get us, again, grounded. And if you're returning, these are slides that you've seen. We'll go through this pretty quickly. Um, just as a reminder that in 2017, the American Nurses Association, along with HPNA, really um, made a call to action that nurses 
lead and transform palliative care. Now, many of us have been in this area for much longer than that. And, uh, but it's been really the beginning of some new momentum, particularly around um, education. So out of that report, their very first recommendation was that um, folks adopt the end of life nursing education consortium. That's what LNEC stands for. Uh, and listed here are the various type uh, curricula. And at that time, uh, the online undergraduate module was available in 2017. Later came the graduate module as part of education. So for those of you that are not familiar, there's sort of the historical look at all the different uh, modules or, or curriculum that have come out of the, the LNEC uh, teams. And you can see highlighted in 2017 was the first iteration of the online module, which then was updated, I want to say 2020. Andrea, you can correct me there. And then we are in the process of releasing sometime this year an um, updated online module for undergrad. Ooh, wrong direction. So as some of you may know um, or not, uh, then more recently came the new essentials which really looked at um, uh, competency-based education for undergrad and graduate students and had these two different levels uh, for entry to practice and then advanced level. And what was really wonderful to see for many of us was that hospice and palliative care and supportive care got a seat at the table equal to the other areas for the first time and sort of uh, privileged um, this sort of education, this type of education in nursing uh, as for the first time really ever. And so that was really exciting. And out of that release, some of us got together and wanted to take a look at the CARES and the GCARES statements, which had um, been developed before that are really competency uh, assessments and recommendation statements for educating undergraduate and graduate students acronym is CARE and G-CARE. So we wanted to look at how well those things aligned with the essentials and realized even though the um, they were not very old, they needed to be updated and uh, aligned better with the essentials. And so a team of us did that work. And you can see here that the um, 17 competency space statements really just were reduced down to 15. Uh, we collapsed some. There is an publication, if you're really interested in, in uh, getting into the weeds of that process, um, we'd be happy to share that. Uh, what I did uh, from those 15 competency statements was just go back and take a look at the ones where there is some clear alignment with today's material, which is pain <clears throat> management and palliative care. So uh, the competency statements number 10, 11, 12, and 13 really um, address some aspect of pain care. And I won't read them all here, but um, important I think is use of evidence-based tools to perform a holistic assessment of pain and other symptoms, synthesize the data to develop a plan of care and conduct ongoing reassessment and evaluation. So for those of you that are teaching pain in your curriculum somewhere, these elements probably are very familiar and then provide culturally sensitive care that is responsive to rapidly changing physical um, and so forth um, symptoms in the during the time dying process and after death. So that's just sort of um, a reflection on how these competency statements align with today's um, module. And, and just so y'all know, the, yes. the CARES, the G-CARE statements, all of those documents, there's several different versions available, some with just the statement, some with alignment tools. Those are all on the LNEC webpage. So those are free access. You can go to the LNEC website and find those right on the homepage for LNEC. Yes. And we can at some point today, if you really, if you really want, we can uh, drop them in the, in the chat if you'd like to look at those. They're very helpful as you look at... Uh, curriculum development. So for those of you that might want to go back that weren't able to review what we did, um, these different 
webinars are on the faculty corner, which is right now in the middle of a, um, I guess, a update. And uh, I, I didn't pull it up, but maybe Megan, you could pull up the site and we can share it later um, if you wanna take a look at that. But this is where all the past webinars live. If you wanna go back in, this one will be recorded. The slides from today are there. So we'll kind of take a break and we'll start again in the fall with symptom assessments. And we are alternating between undergrad and graduate. So I think in the fall, we'll start with the online graduate pain module. And if you have any questions, just feel free um, to pop them in the chat. Now, I, I think somewhat related to the uh, essentials, we, um, LNEC, the LNEC team has seen, we monitor this um, monthly, um, a ongoing uptick in the requests for the, these uh, curriculum. And so these are the latest number of undergraduate school and um, graduate programs that are requesting access to the online modules. And for those of you that don't know, if you are interested in looking at these, you can get free tokens um, by emailing lnec at cityofhope.org. Get help me. <laughs> Somebody. Yeah, I'm I'm in the chat. Huh? Okay, thank you. Um, any faculty, yourself, and any members of your team can get free tokens, um, and they are good for a year. At this point, we're working on maybe uh, changing that. But at this point, that's what you have access to. So another sort of important, uh, we, we've just put these in, these slides here in every month uh, that recognize that we're sometimes addressing when we're talking about palliative and end-of-life care with our students, um, areas that can be triggering and evoke past experiences. So these, the next two, this slide and the next one are some some language uh, that different faculty are using here at the University of Portland. The teaching team recognizes that some of the content may stir up past trauma or difficult experiences and so forth. And it gives students the um, recognizing that the opportunity to leave the classroom if they need to and follow up with faculty. And then there's um, a similar text in our simulation area. And I love the very first one, establishing this basic assumption that everyone participating in the activities in this facility are intelligent, capable, caring about doing their best and wants to improve. And, and it goes on to talk about how it may be a difficult material and how that is um, a safe container, if you will. So those are just in here um, as examples of uh, what we're doing here at University of Portland. So um, if there are questions, Megan? Um, None have come through the chat yet that I've seen. So if we want to start showing the module, I'll keep an eye out. Right. Um, or I've answered them if, if there have been some. OK. Yeah. So um, you will, Tim, hi, Tim. You will absolutely have access. Oh, she answered, sorry. <laughs> All right, so here we go. Here's a little drive-by. We're not, the purpose of this sort of uh, demonstration is to just show you if you're not familiar, or if it's been a long time since you've actually looked at these modules, um, what, what's in there for students. And then we'll spend some time looking at ways that you can take this and sort of unpack it in the classroom or unpack it in simulation or debriefing or in the clinical setting. So there are a lot of different ways. You know, it's wonderful if schools are using these modules and uh, what we like to, um, that's been like, that's the first step, right? But then how are we helping students to process it? Is it, is it more than turn in your certificate of completion and you get X number of points in X course, right? Is there, are there other ways and things that we should be doing to support learning, um, student learning? All right, so here's our little drive-by. Um, I wanna get to your nurse, and I, I love the way that it's, there's, these modules are speaking to the, the student. Your nursing role is very important as you contribute your expertise and so forth. So it's really engaging with the, the viewer. 
And here are the learning objectives uh, for this particular module, which I think most of them are estimated to be complete in an hour. And this one actually has a little bit more material in it. And so I think that it has um, an hour and a half or something like that designated. So I want to look at my little notes here about when it, where I want to take us. So the first place that I thought we could look at is this idea of the bio, um, psychosocial, spiritual model. And this is an example of how the students then will have to click on each of these, understanding this module, and then open this one up and take a look at that, read that, and then go open all of them. Now you cannot, I think because I opened everything already, if I push ex, uh, next, I'm going to be able to go ahead, but the students cannot. If I uh, only looked at two of them, oh no, I do have to, no matter, even if I've viewed it before. So the, you can, I mean, it is a bit click and move on, but you really do have to open up, the student has to open up everything and engage with it. Um, so barriers to pain relief, they are, you know, uh, addressed through the healthcare professionals, the healthcare system, patients and families and society. And so there's a little um, sort of bullet for each one of these. And then the student gives it a try. So give it a try. So then they have this sort of model and I'm just gonna not even read. I'm just going like this so that you can see kind of how it works. I missed it. So I missed it, I missed it. Okay, there, I got it right. And there we go. So um, that's how this works. Another one, give it a try. I think I might be able to go. I wanna show you an interview now. So I. I'm this is an example of a pain assessment interview. So uh, again, you might have students do this as pre-work for class and then in the classroom, um, have them do a pain assessment with each other or something like that. So let's just give a listen to this for a minute. And I have it at the top volume. So if you're having trouble hearing, there are um, closed caption. Ayn Quinn, I'm one of the nurses. I'm going to be taking care of you today. Okay. Um, do you mind if I sit down for a minute, please? Okay. I know that you came in last night and um, you were in a lot of pain and we tried to give you some medicine in the IV. And I just want to know how your, how your night went. Not well. Not well. Was the pain any better control than when you were at home? No. No? No. Okay. Do you mind if I ask you some questions about that? I know you're not comfortable right now, but this is going to help me see, help, help me help you. Okay. okay. Where is your pain right now? In my hip. In your hip? Okay. Is that something that's new or have you had that for a while? No. It's been coming on for about a week. But uh, last night it was just unbearable. I just, I just couldn't stand it. Okay. I came in for some help. Right. And I understand that you. So this goes on to finish the pain assessment. And then they have some. Um, key points from that interview. So this is a bit of a summary for the students and then they practice again. And then they look at elements of physical examination and the importance of reassessment of pain. And then this is another example of communicating to the provider after the assessment. Williams, I'm so glad to see you. Um, she just went back to x-ray, but I have to tell you, to the pain assessment, and she came in last night just because she was in so much pain at home, and she didn't sleep a wink. And we kind of have her on exactly what she was on at home, orally in the IV, and it's just not helping. It's a new pain for her, and she can't function, and she's really miserable. So I was thinking maybe we could go up on her rate and increase her rate and do something kind of soon because she's been here all night, and not that. So the really clever thing here is they, they go over key points from that um, exchange. And then when you do a comprehensive pain assessment, here's another example of what, okay, that's incorrect, that's incorrect, that, that, there we go. Um, I'm trying to get us to, um, oh, I wonder if I missed it. So there's, there is a, um, Sorry, let me let me go on here. Here we go. This is what I wanted to show you is 
an opportunity to say, oh, what might we have added to that? What was missing from that interaction? And um, then maybe do that kind of thing in the classroom and see how many, how comprehensive their assessment can be. So if you really listen to that uh, interaction, you would see that maybe we didn't hear about the quality of pain. Maybe we didn't get a report on the pain intensity and nothing makes it better and any movement makes it worse. So um, I like that they have missed some pieces um, and then it gives the, the students a chance to um, go look for those or have a discussion about those. And then the next section is really all about um, different uh, medications and the importance of a team. So it goes, uh, goes through all of the different pain modalities or pharmacological and then non-pharmacological interventions. And then there's a separate section at the very end that looks at pediatric There pain. are so many things that we cannot cure. Pain is not one of them. Pain is unacceptable. As healthcare providers, we are responsible for doing excellent assessments providing interventions that will relieve that pain and to then come back and reevaluate and fine tune the management of those symptoms. We, this is especially important with children that are too young to tell us with their words that they are experiencing pain. So then it goes on to look at tools for um, assessment in children. And then there's also special populations, which is important to review. Um, under treatment in older adults, and then uh, more about other folks that are at risk. And finally, it ends with the importance of the nurse's role in pain assessment. So that's, that's kind of a, a quick drive-by of that module. And one thing to know, so for all of the, on, the online LMAC modules, the way that, that they work is that after students have completed all of their components, and again, you can't progress until you've completed all the elements on the, the current slide, so to speak. At the end, students progress to a knowledge assessment, which is a, a, a test, so to speak, with multiple choice questions. They're NCLEX style questions. Students achieve, if they achieve an 80%, then they get a certificate of completion for the module itself. If they don't get an 80%, they're encouraged to review and, and take the test again. There's different questions, so they don't necessarily get the same test every time. Um, but it's important for faculty to know that once they get an 80%, they cannot take it again. So um, if you are uh, some faculty want to see their test score, but just know you need to sort of treat an 80 to 100 as the same and give those same point totals because students cannot take that again to try to get 100. Um, but then they do get a certificate of completion. So for a lot of schools, if they have students do these as sort of prep work for class or outside, um, almost like textbook reading, they'll have students upload that completion certificate into their learning management system as sort of a ticket to class or a way to, to verify that they've completed that module. Um, it's not a certificate. If they get all six of these, are they are not LNEX certified, but it's completion of those modules. Right, so that's, a, that's an important distinction. This is not a certification. Um, LNEC doesn't provide certifications, but a certificate of completion, which is wonderful to add to their resumes. So um, with that, uh, I thought maybe now would be a uh, opportunity before we break out uh, to just um, take advantage of our amazing expert here um, if you have any particular questions. And um, I'm gonna start and, and then leave it for the rest of you to uh, jump in. Um, start your pace. I'm particularly having watched the the pendulum really swing over the last few decades, right? With um, access to pain care, the the emphasis at some one point, the undertreatment of pain, and a lot of effort that went towards moving that uh, needle um, and to where we are now. And the many of the the faculty here are familiar with substance use disorder and teaching our students about that. So I wonder if you could share kind of your perspective uh, for the team here. 
Yeah, well, Andra, that's a really complicated question, and it's one that's <laughs> near and dear to my heart. So I guess taking little pieces of this, um, uh, it's really important because of the media attention to the opioid epidemic, um, the um, the way in which the public often conflates, for example, fentanyl um, that's being used illicitly with fentanyl that we use therapeutically, particularly in the, the cancer world. I think it's helpful when we work with students to start with a question about their beliefs and their biases. And everyone has um, you know, experiences with either their own painful situation or that of a loved one. And it's it's useful to have those kinds of dialogues. So we learn a little bit about our own bias, our own stigma that we apply to people with pain, people who are taking opioids. But you're right, Andra, I've been around for a very long period of time. So I saw the time when I was a brand new grad and we did a horrible job with managing cancer pain and people were crying out in pain. And we moved that needle with lots of education and um, people were then getting better pain control. Now, maybe that pendulum may have gone a little bit far. You can certainly look at lots of literature about that. And more opioids, came into the community and people who were at risk for addiction got access to those medications. What I like to point out to all clinicians now is that it's not the misuse of prescription opioids that is really contributing to our challenge with this abuse or misuse of opioids and the epidemic. Um, that it is now illicit substances, and it has been for about the past 10 years. But interventions that have been designed to prevent prescription drugs from getting into the community are really having a very negative effect on people with pain. We are seeing insurance companies not paying or requiring a lot of pretty burdensome um, paperwork like prior authorizations, and we are seeing some major shortages right now. Um, again, even for people who have a serious illness like cancer or other illnesses. So it's really a complex phenomenon. And um, there was a brilliant opinion piece in the New York Times just this past weekend by um, Nicholas Kristoff, who I, I love his writing, and he's a kind of a neighbor of Andra right there because he's from the Oregon area and grew up in the Oregon area. And the title of the opinion piece is um, Why Do Americans Experience So Much Pain? And it's about those deaths of despair. Um, it's a really an interesting um, uh, piece that will be somewhat provocative. So, so that's a little bit about, gosh, how challenging all of these conversations about pain can be. Um, when we look at what we, the essential information that our, our undergraduate nursing students need to know, I, I wanna let you know that you're doing a great job, all of you, um, mm -hmm. because I do the, um, the introductory courses or lectures on pain for our new nurses um, entering into on the oncology um, uh, units. And I have to say, I've been so impressed with their level of knowledge and sophistication related to pain. So you as educators are really doing a fantastic job. So um, I, I would say that finally, the, the emphasis on that biopsychosocial spiritual model is really crucial so that it isn't just a knee-jerk reaction that we order a medication and we give a medication, that we do try to look at that whole person and that we try to use interventions that attend to each of those areas, the, the psychosocial, the spiritual, um, and the physical. And it's not all opioids for every patient, for sure, whether you're an inpatient clinician or an outpatient clinician. And probably the last major focus that's a little bit different 
um, that also is aligned with this question of the opioid epidemic. We were so focused on zero to 10. And um, as you see in the assessment piece of this module, not everybody can conceptualize their pain as a number. But even then, was it appropriate for us to aim for zero pain 24 seven? So in fact, now it's really a focus on function. If we could do a better job with your pain control, what will you be able to do that you can't now? So for that inpatient post-operative person, it might be, you know, ambulate in the hallways or do my pulmonary hygiene. Um, for my cancer patient, it might be for some return to work, for others walk around the block, and for some being able to hold their grandchild. So we tailor or personalize the outcome based upon function rather than intensity. Mm -hmm. So I know that was long-winded, Andra, mm -hmm. sorry, but no. you, you got me talking about my favorite yeah. topic in the world, so <laughs> I can't help myself. Thank you very much. Um, anybody have other questions for Dr. Pace? We're doing really well with time. Now's your chance. You're welcome to put it in the chat or open your mic and ask. Either way works fine for us. Or share some of your own experiences if you like. Oh, here comes Denise, I think. Yeah. Hey, Judy, I just wanted to ask you because I've been having uh, struggling in the geriatric population with, because I'm an old pain nurse. So I wanted, you know, we used to give a lot of NSAIDs and we used to give low dose opioids and all of that for arthritic pain and for neuropathic pain in that population, but it really isn't um, the appropriate, or it seems to not be accepted as the appropriate way to manage that pain now. What are you doing to help with that population with that type of, just the, the old chronic arthritic, and neuropathic pain in that in the on call in the geriatric oncology patient. So Denise, you are not an old pain nurse. You are a seasoned <laughs> pain nurse. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, seriously, you've raised several questions. One an important one is when we think about the three classes of drugs: the non-opioids, the opioids, and the adjuvant analgesics. We have new knowledge about the non opioids, particularly the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, which is what most of us would turn to with an arthritic kind of pain syndrome, you know, the aching throbbing. However, in the geriatric population, the adverse effects are pretty profound. Okay. They're, they're pretty profound in, in all populations, but the geriatric population is particularly at risk. Of course, we always think about GI bleed, you can mitigate that with the use of a COX-2 inhibitor, at least for a while, or through the use of a PPI in addition to um, the NSAID. However, renal compromise is serious in the older adult, and we have newer knowledge about the cardiovascular risks, particularly in people at risk for stroke and MI. And so an NSAID may not be the right drug for a lot of our elders. So more and more people are acknowledging that maybe, since we may not have other alternatives, again, if we can improve function, it may be appropriate to use a low dose of an opioid, very low doses of opioids. The general rule of thumb is you start very low, you go very slow, and actually, we learned over time that many of our elders end up in the same place. It just took us a very long period of time to get there, right? Because we need to be safe with the older adult. So um, I hope that kind of answers that piece. And then you mentioned the neuropathic pain. Again, we do have to be cautious with the gabapentinoids. This would be gabapentin or pregabalin, Neurontin and Lyrica. Um, because the dose needs to be lowered in people with renal compromise. So if their creatinine clearance calculated is less than 60, mm -hmm. we generally 
with a gabapentin, for example, we instead of giving it three times a day, we might give it twice a day. The And I always reassure patients, the gabapentinoids are not causing this kidney dysfunction, but with pre-existing renal dysfunction, you're not able to excrete the agent. So, so those are some of the particular challenges with the older adult. And, and Dan mentioned that the NSAIDs may be contraindicated in people with congestive heart failure. And yes, Dan, precisely because of those cardiovascular risks. So yes, thank you. And Noreen asks, how low, for example, 2.5 to 5 milligrams of morphine? Yes, it can be that low. Um, which is challenging then in the U.S. because our lowest dose of a tablet is 15 milligrams of morphine. So sometimes I look at using other agents. It doesn't have to be morphine. Um, it could be you know, five milligrams of oxycodone and even cutting that in half if the patient is savvy enough to do that. Or we sometimes use liquid morphine. Again, with my ambulatory patients, that's challenging. You know, trying to measure out the liquid and things. We typically, you know, use those a lot with our hospice patients. But for many patients who are, you know, very functional, carrying around that liquid can be a pain in the neck. So, Denise, what other questions? You're you're very expert at this yourself. You're just presenting to the undergrads with Eden Brower. So, um, and I just ran up here and I said, "Gotta go! I gotta go talk to Judy Pace." But, uh, <laughs> You know, they're, they're, you know, they're first timers and really looking at it. So just looking at, at how to teach them this. It's so, you know, they have these case studies. Some of our LNA case studies are so cancer heavy and extend all these comorbid, everything going on. That for these first timers, I just kind of took a chunk of one and said, let's just keep an assessment because it I thought they're going to be overwhelmed. They're, you know, when you start looking at some of our older adults with chronic arthritis already and with, you know, other diseases that are, you know, if I started going into, you can't give them this because of that and this and that CHF, I just thought they would get too overwhelmed. So I kept it really simple, but right. this has been the, the age group that, you know, in the early days of pain management, remember we started NSAIDs when they first started and we were just miracle workers. All of our older patients that had arthritis as a background pain, we just thought we were just amazing because we took that pain away. But then we found out we couldn't do that anymore. So I, I just been a challenge trying to wonder what to give them to help. So thank you. I, I'm glad we can still do some low dose. I wanted yes. to interject really quickly that um, I, we have such great experts here in the current practice. And one of the, it, it reminds me that for those of you that may feel um, like this isn't your area of expertise as a teacher. Um, the modules will help uh, to actually go through and do the module yourself, identify your own gaps, and uh, also attend one of the LNEC uh, courses. Uh, we had one in Hawaii recently, not a bad place to go. Um, <laughs> but we had, I think maybe, oh, Andrea, maybe you could remind me, somewhere around 20 faculty that attended. And um, there's one coming up later in the fall. You can go to the LNEC webpage and see. So if you're finding that you're like, oh gosh, you know, I, I need a little um, professional development in this area, um, that's a great place to get the, to hear from these experts. So I, I, I know Dan has a question, but I wanna piggyback on what Denise was saying. I think one of our challenges with this undergrad group as well is that they are not savvy enough to necessarily be able to um, unpack or debunk the misconceptions that are out there related to pain. So I often find when I'm when I'm teaching this, we have to spend the beginning of our in class time really just sort of um, identifying misinformation, going to you know reputable sources. Let's actually find out what's true and real and accurate, and make sure we're all clear on what what we're talking about before we get into what as a nurse do we do about it. So kind of demystifying some of that is a helpful place to start off, letting them ask those questions that are really bothering them so that they can have that answered. And then we can move on with actually trying to get into the content more. We have, um, I think, did Dan have his hand up? Yeah. Well, yeah. Dan, what's your question? It's a plug. Um, I, I'm t I've been teaching the LNEC undergraduate for eight years now, seven years in San Diego County and now in Hawaii. So uh, undergraduate hasn't been around that long, but uh, um, I've taught LNIC 
they, uh, when you sign up for the uh, free access as a faculty, free access to the, <clears throat> to the modules, you also get the wonderful supplemental materials. And I use those supplemental materials when I do in-class discussions because the students complete their modules asynchronously on their own time. Their instructor gives them a deadline. Like you, you know, their, their assignment is to complete modules one and two by such and such a date. And then we discuss them in class. Here at Chaminade, we're discussing one and two back to back in the first of three med search courses. The reason I'm, I'm putting in a plug for the supplemental faculty materials is there's some very good discussion prompts um, for faculty. And that's mostly what I use in the hour or so that I'm given to discuss the, the modules with the students to, to, to apply the content that I've learned. One of the, there's a very good exercise that you can give people ahead of time, which is to either go to a pharmacy or go to a pharmacy's website and find as many products as you can containing acetaminophen. And then you can talk about uh, you know, acetaminophen toxicity and you know, maximum daily dose, et cetera, and why it's important you know, when you're assessing people's current. Thank you. There are the, there, uh, there, those, there are the um, discussion no, questions. You would have thought that we rehearsed that, but thank you once again. Dan. I'm, I'm, I'm a plant. I, I, yeah, I'll, I, I assume the check's in the mail, right, Andra? <laughs> Yeah, uh, the, so, the discussion yeah. questions are very good if you're going to teach the LNEC modules because the students get the content uh, on their own time. And then we, with the nursing expertise and hopefully some palliative care expertise, um, can utilize LNEC's um, discussion questions or what are they called? Educational strategies. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. yeah, why call it a discussion question? You can call it an educational strategy. Uh, it's it, that's that's my strategy. So LNEC makes it very easy to teach this material when you do in person or even on Zoom. You can do it uh, in real time with with also, your students after they've completed the modules. So uh, thank you so much. And Andrea just dropped in um, one of I think one of the documents, pain supplemental um, material, which might be something that we could take some time in breakout rooms and look at. Um, and then this document, okay, so this is what you put in, but there's another one too for, um, that actually has some other supplemental um, items. This one has a, a, a case study that you can use um, in our small groups. Maybe we can talk about other things that we're doing. So why don't we then peel off for maybe 10 minutes? Ooh, we there are a few more questions in the chat. Okay, maybe we shouldn't we could... do that then. Let's, I think let's get, get those answered and then. Yes, okay. So there's a so, question from Noreen. So one of the questions is from Noreen about chronic kidney failure. Should we increase the time between the next intake of medication and how much can we give the patient an opioid once a day? So it's a little bit more complicated than that. If, we're, if the patient is, uh, has chronic kidney disease and has an opioid, we need to consider certain opioids are not optimal. So this is where it gets a little bit into the weeds, but drugs like morphine, codeine, tramadol, and the old agent called meperidine, which in the US is not used anymore really very often. Sometimes it's, um, it's called pethidine in the international world. And Noreen, I, I, I know you're in Armenia. Um, the those agents should not be used in people with chronic kidney disease. For the other agents that we have available in the United States, like oxycodone, um, hydromorphone, even methadone, um, those agents can be given a little bit further apart, but again, keep reassessing, reassessing and determine if the patient is getting adequate pain control. And methadone in particular is unique and may be of particular benefit in people with significant renal disease because it is the only opioid that is not excreted renally. It is excreted fecally through the bile salts. And so renal dysfunction does not seem to alter its um, excretion. You don't get accumulation. However, 
it's a really complicated drug to use. So pretty much all of the guidelines, European, US, cancer, non-cancer, suggest that you need to get a pain consult or a palliative care consult if you are starting methadone for pain control. And Narina, I don't know if you were also commenting about other, other analgesics, but that is exactly what you need to do is to spread it out if you're using a gabapentinoid like, you know, gabapentin. If someone has chronic kidney disease as evidenced by a creatinine clearance that calculated that's um, beneath 60, um, then you would have to lower the dose and instead of TID dosing, you give BID dosing. And I'm going to be honest with you, I always go to my Hippocrates and verify what, what's the dose I should be using in this particular patient. Um, Jamie asked about uh, peripheral ar uh, artery disease. Um, I'm thinking vascular perfusion. You're absolutely right. Anything we can do to improve that. Um, but you are seeing providers ordering opioids. There may be times when that's appropriate, but you're right. Better to do disease-modifying treatment first, if we can. And then a lot of this depends upon the goals of care for that patient. You know, is this a patient who's got really serious cardiovascular disease and has a very limited lifespan? then opioids may be appropriate. If this patient has um, maybe a very, very long prognosis, that may not be um, the right agent. So, and Noreen, I'm glad to see you've got methadone in um, Armenia. So let's see, I think. That's all the questions I see. So thanks so much for that wealth of information. Please continue y'all to put questions in the chat. We are going to move on with our last little bit of time to do some activities and breakouts, but we will yeah. continue to monitor that chat. I wonder, Megan, if we have time actually for that. Maybe just do it together. Maybe Let's we don't just do, break do it out. together. Do I don't think we should, um, mm -hmm. but you can see on the, on the slide here, some things that it, one of the overarching purposes of these webinars is for us to connect with each other and share expertise. And as Betty Farrell would say, like, let's not keep it to ourselves. Let's get this out to everyone. So there are great things going on everywhere. Um, one kind of standard lead question is to share how you are incorporating palliative care education. If I would say with the shortness of time, if you're challenged by, if you're having trouble at your school with integration, reach out to Megan and I, that's part of the grant that we're on is to help support schools of nursing. Um, and we will we will connect with you. Um, so please do that. Um, but also let's talk about how we can help each other to advance palliative care education. So you have um, the last document that was dropped in, the pain core supplement material has um, lots of stuff. And I actually had looked at, um, let's go, come on, there. These two sections on page eight is a pain case study that I think came from you, Judy. I think you developed this. So I would um, invite anyone to, to read through that, take a look at that, see how you might use that, as Dan was saying, after class, after they've done a particular module, I mean, coming into the classroom and how we can maybe use something like this. And then the other thing that's really, I think, really helpful um, is starting on page 17, there are teaching tips and there's a section on page 16 that is specific for um, faculty. And then it has different sort of educators in the clinical environment and tips there. So um, these are also some guides to how you may, if you're not sure how you might do this, um, things that you, or things that you'd like to add to stuff that you're already doing. Um, so maybe with that, we can just ask folks to share um, kinds of things that you're doing. I mentioned earlier that one of the things that I have done is um, after doing um, some pain um, assessment education to have students team up with each other and I give a nurse role and a, and a, a patient role and they have different information on them. The, the patient is not to reveal anything unless they're asked. So it get, it's an opportunity to see what parts of an assessment students are capturing and then have kind of a group discussion about what was, where their gap, where there were gaps. So let's hear from you all. So there's a question in the chat, learning how to integrate this information in the BSN nursing curriculum. 
um, very, very high level answer to that would be um, there is no right or wrong way to do that. That really it, it's looking at your, your current program. A lot of schools have had success with looking at where some of this content is already taught and seeing how there might be an exchange. One of the, the arguments we use a lot as well is that textbooks do not have this content effectively included or they're outdated. And so these LNEC modules can almost be thought of in some contexts like a textbook or a resource for the course so students get the latest evidence-based practice. These are updated every three years and then we'll, we'll show the faculty corner at the very end where there's daily or weekly updates as well with more information. Um, and then on the faculty corner, this was posted just in the last month or two, one of our colleagues from Creighton University shared a document that she used at her university to propose integrating these modules into her curriculum. And it actually worked really well to move it through curricula committee. Um, so just know that there's resources on the corner to even just help write up that proposal. Um, but it, it's some people do it in one course, some people thread it across the curriculum. Um, when students get access, it's $29 US right now per access per the student, and it's for 12 months. So it's really kind of thinking about how you might best structure that within 12 months, or some schools will have students purchase a token again to extend that. Um, but there's no right or wrong way. If you want more specifics or you need help with your specific program, that's where Andrew and I can step right. in and actually meet with you and kind of dialogue one-on-one -on -one about the unique experiences for your school. We're going to take you, Pamela. We're going to, oh, Andrea just put in a link. So the question was, how do you get there? Um, again, it's getting a little bit of a, a redo right now. So um, we'll share that with you in just a minute. There's a question in the chat. How are you assessing those with dementia and providing treatments? And there is dementia content in LNEC um, undergraduate, but um, I'll open the floor to Judy to answer more. Megan, you, you hit the nail on the head. There are even examples of the tools that can be used, like the pain ad, um, which are tools that are um, focused more on behavioral cues when people with advanced dementia are unable to, to verbalize. And the treatment is the same as with the, you know, the adult patient without dementia. Again, based upon that biopsychosocial spiritual modules or um, foundation. So, you know, it might be medicines, it might be heat, it might be topical menthol, it might be passive range of motion for the person who's deconditioned. Um, again, we think about all of those buckets, if you will, the biologic, the psychologic, the social, the spiritual, um, and we try to address all of those. And I think the other message that you've probably heard woven throughout the LNEC curriculum is that the nurse doesn't have to do it alone, but the nurse can consult or, you know, depending upon the limitations of their institution, can consider all the other professionals who can help. And certainly with the person with, you know, advanced dementia, there's there's so much we can do. There is a, I wanted to draw folks' attention on that one document that um, the core, there is a assessment tool in there that is the pain ad, AD. So that's specifically for this population. And and as we mentioned, we've been updating the module. There's There's um, content related to care of patients with dementia threaded in other of the ILNEC undergrad modules. And then we've even expanded a little bit more um, in the when the new version rolls out, um, citing some statements from like the Alzheimer's Association and some things as we think about symptom management um, as well. I wonder if we want to, um, so one of the other really important pieces here is how do you assess learning? And um, uh, we're all moving more towards a competency-based teaching, learning, and evaluation framework. So with that, um, we have a little bit of some thoughts. So I'm gonna pass it over to Megan. We all, yeah, we have five minutes. Yes, so um, as Andrew mentioned, we are moving to competency-based education. Back in 2018, she and I uh, started a project where we developed um, a competence assessment tool for palliative care. We are happy to share this. It has been recently published in Nursing Education Perspectives, which is NLN's journal. Um, but you'll see here, Andrew sort of 
highlighted that we have some behavioral things that we would want to see a student perform as a way to demonstrate their competence within this realm of pain. So we'd want them to be using standardized tools to assess pain and its meaning. We'd want them to be prioritizing and using evidence-based interventions, both non-pharmacological and pharmacological. Um, there should be education about ongoing pain and symptom management, and then that reassessment. And um, one of the things that you might note is that these align a lot with our CARES language and our G-CARES language. Um, and, and that was intentional, that we wanna make sure we're consistent in, in sort of those more broad competence expectations that you might see in the essentials and in the CARES and G-CARES statements. These we've sort of modified to say, what would I want to see a student do in a simulation or in a class setting or in a clinical setting to help me understand that they know how to do this competently. So that there's some of the pain related statements that we have in our competence assessment tool. And again, we're um, happy to share that. It's not on the corner yet because um, we were trying to track who, who wants to be using that, but you're welcome to email us and we can share it. Yes. So here's a couple of resources. Um, the development of that tool is right there if you want to take a look at that. And then you want to close us out with just a little tour of the faculty corner. And I just want to say before we do that, thank you everyone for being here. I see some folks are needing to peel off. We're going to be doing some other behind the scenes things this summer, um, looking at those supplemental materials, for example, Dan, and updating those um, and some other work. And we'll return to these uh, webinars in the fall. Okay, Megan, I'm going to stop screen. Yeah, so oh, let me, even this, have is, to. this is Elmick Faculty Corner, and it just got a major change in layout. So if you haven't been to the AACM website this week, um, it's got a new layout. Can y'all see it okay? Yep. Okay. So um, again, and we're working closely with AACN to try to modify this. So please keep checking it out. Things might relocate but they're not going to leave the, the corner. But this is a really a landing page for faculty at schools of nursing for all the resources that we feel we want to be sharing. Um, so as you see our webinar for today is up at the top. Um, this, if you go under new publications, that sample proposal I mentioned for how can you integrate it in the curriculum, it's available right there. Our CARES, do care statement and those tools are available here. Um, and as you scroll down, there's this whole section on teaching and evaluation tools. And this is where we're, we're asking colleagues around the country to share what they're doing. We know faculty are doing incredible work in teaching their students about palliative care. And so if you want to share what you're doing, please feel free to, to do that. Um, there's a section down here at the bottom called for submissions where you can Again, share with us those, those resources that you're using in your class or those strategies that you're using, and we can make it available. Um, so you can see there's publications we've made available. Um, some colleagues have shared their case studies that they've used. Some have shared their simulations that, they've, that they're doing at their schools. Um, and you'll find that these are posted different ways. Some of our colleagues have provided sort of a summary of what that experience looks like with their contact information if you want the full packet. Others have provided the full document. It kind of depends on, on what they were most comfortable with uh, sharing at that time. But this is where you can find all of those resources. Um, uh, and, and this changes all the time because we keep getting submissions and we're continuing to grow um, this section. Anything? Andrew, I, wanted, I wanted to just add one thing that I heard from an a, someone on an ACN webinar, and it just it was they were channeling Dr. Farrell in some ways, who is all about getting this material out. So I want to just read it in closing uh, to really encourage folks to share what you're doing. Assignments are powerful teaching tools, and their design is one of the most consequential intellectual tasks that faculty undertake in their work as educators. Um, yet, that work is often private and unavailable to colleague exchange and knowledge building. So let's just shift that paradigm, shall we? <laughs> and, and share our things. Any final words, Judy? Anybody? Thank you, Dr. Pace, for joining us today. Yes. No, so it's my pleasure. 
you're all doing a tough job. Thank you so much for doing it. As a clinician, I so appreciate that you're you know, preparing our next generation. So thank you. We have to have nurses that'll take care of us, Judy. <laughs> <laughs> See you all in the fall. Thanks, everyone, for joining today. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye.